Beetlejuice, Beetlejuice, Beetlejuice. Oh, here you go, it just appeared. Well, looks like we're going to be discussing this beautiful star once again, mostly because there have been some major updates in the last few months and some really intriguing discoveries. But if you haven't seen any of the previous updates from the last few years, check out some of the videos in the description just to get up to date. But I guess if you actually have no idea what we're talking about, it's that red supergiant star in the constellation of Orion, something like 500 to maybe 600 light years away from us, that a few years ago, for some reason, started to dim. Dropping in brightness quite dramatically and resulting in some very strange observations we've never seen before. Here's that famous dip that lasted for a few months. But since then, it actually did start to brighten and, as we've discussed in some of the previous videos, basically returned to normal. Or did it? Well, it turns out that it's maybe dimming once again. You can actually read more about this in one of the articles in the description written by Bob King, an amateur astronomer, but essentially here we have another drop. And it seems to have dimmed by approximately half a magnitude in the last few months. Now, that's nothing compared to the so-called great dimming, but it obviously shows us that it's still not done and it's still doing something else. Although here it's really important to understand that this star is kind of meant to go through different changes in brightness just because of its nature. Unlike our Sun, this is really more of a extremely explosive and low intensity plasma cloud that changes in shape all the time. This beautiful simulation that you see right here, from the scientist whose paper you can find in the description, kind of shows us what this is all about. We'll actually come back to this in a few seconds because this is important for another reason, but in essence this is probably what Beetlejuice is really like. Obviously much slower than this, but this is what it does every few months. And it's essentially also a variable star with a period of about 400 days, but it also has another longer period where it changes brightness every 2000 days as well. So there is a chance that maybe this is actually what's happening here right now. Although we're not really going to know for another few months. But here the question was always about the great dimming. It's definitely something that we've never seen before for the past 200 years, and this was definitely something really incredible. And turns out that a lot of recent studies might have finally solved everything here, based on observations from various telescopes going back 15 years, and by observing Betelgeuse in a lot of different frequencies, including microwaves and infrared. Which in essence allowed them to see Betelgeuse by piercing through various layers and trying to figure out what's inside. And one of the telltale signs here was essentially the detection of silicon monoxide. The spectrum of this particular element suggested only one thing. This had nothing to do with supernova or Betelgeuse about to explode, but had everything to do with some kind of a really large dust cloud. In this case, it's very likely that quite a lot of material from Betelgeuse somehow separated or very likely got blown away by internal activity, forming a tremendously large gas cloud right above Betelgeuse. This was very likely something that happened over a period of several months and potentially started sometime in 2019. And then within just a few months, by early 2020, a much colder region formed right under this cloud, producing a kind of a dark spot. And because this spot was much cooler, it allowed for condensation of various particles, which then resulted in a relatively dark cloud containing a lot of silicon monoxide and potentially something else. And it was actually this dust that then blocked Betelgeuse as seen from planet Earth. And in astronomy, normally, silicon monoxide is actually used as a kind of a tracer. A tracer for different types of gas that became shocked during stellar emissions. And that's because normally, even when it gets really hot, this gas, or this type of dust, still persists. It doesn't melt, it doesn't disappear. And since there was very clear evidence for this gas during this time, there's really no additional explanations required. A lot of this is actually explored more in the study right here that you can find in the description, and all of this was based on observations in infrared light that allowed the scientists to detect silicon monoxide. But the thing is, not everything is of course explained in terms of why this happened or how all of this progressed. Because we know that something must have happened inside Betelgeuse, very likely in 2018, that generated some kind of a very strong shock that then resulted in something being emitted from the surface. And so the observations in the infrared, along with previous data from the telescope known as Stella, allowed the researchers to figure out how various shockwaves inside Betelgeuse very likely produced all of this. And here the scientists believe that there were probably two separate shockwaves. First one was very deep inside Betelgeuse and was probably very powerful, and it generated a lot of outflow that brought a lot of material to the surface. And so here this strong shockwave very likely happened around February 2018, 
but then there was an additional, weaker shockwave approximately one year later. And it was actually the combination of these two shockwaves that then resulted in the production of this unusual dust cloud. And so following this second shockwave, a tremendous amount of plasma flow very likely disturbed the surface of Betelgeuse, first generating a hotspot, which was actually confirmed by observations from the Hubble telescope using ultraviolet observations, this was seen in the southern hemisphere of Betelgeuse, which then followed up by a different interaction between layers, changing the overall phase shift due to changes in velocity. Or in other words, it created a dramatic disturbance on at least one side of Betelgeuse. And following these two shockwaves, that's when we get the formation of that dust cloud and the formation of the cold spot. But within two years, all of this seemed to have returned back to normal, even though some of the pulsations seem to still contain a kind of a higher frequency corresponding to the first overtone of that initial shockwave interaction. In other words, it's still kind of vibrating here and there, but not as dramatic as before. And this was of course an extremely powerful event. Even some of the most powerful coronal mass ejections from our own sun usually release approximately 1 billion ton of material. But here Betelgeuse very likely released at least 400 billion tons, but possibly even more. And so this was a sort of a mega coronal mass ejection, but obviously from a very different mechanism, because as I mentioned previously, this is no longer just a star, it's more of a pulsating plasma cloud. And as you can see here, it's filled with a lot of these extremely large convection cells. Something that we know is obviously present on the sun as well, but these are much, much smaller. In comparison to a typical convection cell on the sun, the one on the Betelgeuse can be over 100 million kilometers. You can actually see the Earth's orbit right there for comparison. And the material inside these cells moves really, really fast, up to 30 kilometers per second. And intriguingly, this particular study used these new simulations to try to answer one very important question about Betelgeuse. It kind of had this unusual mystery. The mystery in regards to how fast it's actually spinning. For some reason, a lot of previous observations using radio frequencies determined that Betelgeuse was a bit of an oddball. Normally, in typical stars, especially the ones still burning hydrogen, the rotational velocity can be pretty high, up to 100 km per second. But in red supergiants, it's usually much, much slower. Just hundreds of meters per second, with most rotating even slower, or barely rotating at all. But Betelgeuse, from various observations, was actually spinning much faster. Here it seemed to be spinning at approximately 5 km per second, and that was a bit unusual. And so for many years researchers were actually convinced that this is maybe because of the nature of Betelgeuse from back in the days. Maybe it used to be two stars that collided, and as a result it acquired a lot of angular momentum and is thus spinning much faster. Which also led a lot of scientists to conclude that as a result of this, it's probably not going to go supernova anytime soon, and might actually survive much, much longer than we think. But the researchers behind this new study realized something else. They realized that the data might have been actually skewed because of the motion, and very fast motion, inside of these convection cells. Since Betelgeuse is so extremely active and produces so much velocity already, what we're actually observing is maybe a little bit biased. Now normally, to measure the rotational velocity of a star, the researchers look on both sides of the star and then measure the redshift and the blue shift. The faster the star spins, the more redshift and blue shift we're going to be observing. But in this case, this redshift and blue shift might actually be the result of the convection cells and not necessarily the rotation. With the study itself demonstrating this in a lot of different ways. And so the actual rotational velocity is extremely unlikely to be as high. Here they determine it to be maybe 2 km per second or possibly even lower. Now this is still faster than a lot of other red supergiants, so the binary star collision is still a potential explanation, but definitely not as dramatic as before, which would be very difficult to explain. But then there is I guess a follow-up question. So what about other red supergiants? Are they actually just not exhibiting the same effects? And is Betelgeuse just really strange compared to all of them? Now this is not something I can answer yet and this was not addressed in the paper, but I'm sure we'll get more answers in some of the future studies. Because in some sense, this still suggests that Betelgeuse is maybe a little bit strange and a little bit different from a lot of other red supergiant stars that we know of. But not all. As we discussed in some of the previous videos, there have been some other stars discovered in the last few years that actually exhibited very similar patterns and extremely similar dimming to Betelgeuse in just the last few decades. You can learn more about them in the description. But what's the actual conclusion? 
Well, the first conclusion is that Beetlejuice is not going to go supernova in our lifetimes. I mean, we're all kind of hoping it would go supernova, just to give us that excitement in life, I guess. But yeah, not this star. However, as you might learn in one of the videos coming out really soon, and as we've discussed in one of the previous videos, there might be a Nova coming really soon. Not as exciting, but still exciting. So do subscribe if you want to learn more about this as well, and what all of this means. On that note, thank you for watching, subscribe, we'll definitely come back and talk more about Beetlejuice once there are some updates, support this channel on Patreon by joining channel membership, or by buying the wonderful person t-shirt you can find in the description. Stay wonderful, I'll see you tomorrow, and as always, bye bye.